Trigger warning. This podcast is intended for men. Not boys, not babies, men. This is how we disable toxic masculinity. We need to kill all men. This pagan patriarchalism that is coming back out of the shadows. Feminists hate patriarchy. It's the woman that runs the show and the woman that runs the community and is the backbone of, of that area. I'm a nasty woman. A loud, vulgar, proud woman. Patriarchy. Male privilege. Are you saying you have authority over me? Go eat your superior. I personally can't see why egalitarianism would be a bad thing. The assumption that wives should make babies instead of money is part of the patriarchy. Strange women you don't know. Patriarchy. The patriarchy. 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 For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit. In the inner man. And that is Ephesians 3 14 to 16. And this is the patriarchy. My name is Tony DePani, and I am joined by my co host, Pastor Joseph Randall Spurgeon. Joseph. Woman, get back in here and make me a sandwich. What sandwich are you eating today? Oh, man, I'm having this classic uh, uh, Reuben, corned beef Reuben. It's got Toasted rye bread, sauerkraut, mm, it just kind of makes your mouth pucker, melted Swiss cheese, Russian dressing, and it's just uh, rich corned beef, very tasty, one of my favorite sandwiches, and all of this, what makes it so good, it was just deliciously prepared for me and brought to me by Slotsky's Deli. <laughs> We are not actually paid to say that, but Schlaschke's Deli, if you'd like to contact us and advertise, we'd be happy to. (laughs) I am eating a steak and cheese, an Italian herb and cheese uh, bread with uh, green peppers, onions, a little bit of lettuce. I don't like a lot of lettuce on mine. Uh, Pepper jack cheese and uh, a little bit of dressing, too. And uh, I'm, I'm eating quite a big one. It's pretty good. I like it. Mm. It's a spot, and that that was that was prepared for me with love by Subway. But uh, but Subway, we're we're not paid to say that either. But if you'd like to contact and advertise on the Patriarchy Podcast, <laughs> <laughs> all right, my man. So you have been doing a little bit of reading lately, haven't you? What have you been reading? Uh, I've been reading a book. Well, more like a, a couple articles that were compiled into a book called "The Fate of Empires and the Search for." Survival. It's by a guy named Sir John Glubb. Have you ever heard of him? I had not prior to about a week ago. Uh, so a, a guy that I, I know that maybe I co-host a podcast with introduced me to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sir John Glubb was a uh, lieutenant general. He was a British soldier. He was a scholar and an author. He's, he he. He led and trained the Transjordan Air Legion between 1939 and 1956. He served during the First World War. Wait, wait, was that trans? Was that Transjordan or transgender? Did I say trans? I said Transjordan. Yeah, I know. I just, I, we're just got to make everything wrong. clear for anybody anybody listening. It was Transjordan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> they identify as Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> they currently, currently identify as Jordan. You never know; they might change and identify as something else. But yes. Uh, During the First World War, he served in France. And so he studied uh, the the rise and fall of empires. He looked back over 3,000 years. And uh, the one thing he said uh, in the beginning of this book is that the one thing you learn from history is that men never learn from history. (laughs) That's Uh, that's a good quote. (laughs) Wow, and uh, so he looks over this three hundred year, three thousand years of empires, and, and compares them, studies them for years. He's he writes several books on different empires, so he's 
he's really studied this and he begins to see some traits, some characteristics that come out that show the rise and the fall of empires, the kind of a, the life of an empire across the, the world. And he starts to compare that to the British empire that he was in and even um, somewhat to the American um, empire, if we may call it that. Okay. Yeah. And so what he does, he studies this 3000 years and he comes up with this life cycle of empires and he's got ages. There's basically one, two, three, four, five ages of an empire that an empire goes through kind of like a child through to an adult and then death. Um, and I thought it'd be interesting for our listeners to kind of go through those and then see how that ties back around to what the subject of our podcast is. So let's start with the first, the first age, the first age he calls the age of pioneers. And you can kind of get, uh, the idea of that. It's, it's, uh, the pioneers, like the pilgrims coming to the United States or, you know, to the colonies at the time. And, 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 and to, to clarify for people listening, we're not just talking about the pioneers. That's a, it's an age called the pioneers. So it's, I think you'll explain a little bit more so nobody gets confused. They think we're just talking about like the colonial, colonial people. Yeah. Yeah. No, th- this is uh this age that he gives is for, Uh, every empire that he looks back. It's this time of when you've got rough, 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 rough men braving against uh, nature. They are coming in, oftentimes coming in to take over another empire that was already in the death stages. And so it's a time of rough men, time of violence, uh, whether it's violence against others or violence fighting the nature. There's a lot of death. But men are hard. The women uh, are geared towards helping in this pioneering age. Um, This is actually a quote that he says. Uh, He says, the new nation, the new empire is not only distinguished by victory in battle, but by an unresting enterprise in every field. He said, men hack their way through jungles. They climb mountains or brave the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean in tiny cockle shells. The Arabs crossed the Straits of Gibraltar in AD 711 with 12,000 men, defeated a Gothic army of more than twice their strength, marched straight over 250 miles of unknown enemy territory, and seized the Gothic capital of Toledo. And so it's this time of men being men. It goes into what's called the Age of Conquest, which you've seen there. Was So you have these pioneers that have first established the empire facing off against nature and the age of conquest then is uh, you, you've got your little base put together and now you begin seeking how do we expand? How do we expand? And the example there with the, the Arabs crossing the Straits of Gil, Gibraltar, I can't even, the Straits of Gibraltar, I can't even say it right. Um, so you get this age of conquest. Again, it's where men are men. Uh, there's expansion. You can think of this as the. Um, in American history, the move out west, the the Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that was, a good, um, that was a good game. I I always died. I always died in that game. I think everyone did. Yeah, I think everyone did. Do. <laughs> so hey, during this period though, do we ever hear anybody writing about? Like effeminate men? No, I mean, th- you, you, there might be men like that exist, but they're not right. going to last long. They're not going to be. They're not going to be the leaders in the empire, the leaders in the nation. No, men are hard, and and, and partially or mostly maybe because of the circumstances. Mm-hmm. Right? You can't afford to be soft. If you want to live, you can't afford to be right. soft. And it's it's hard men. It's, it's in one sense, it's alpha m- males that are leading the charge. And, and no one is criticizing it at this time. This is, there's great unity. Um, later on, as he gets in the book, he talks about uh, one of the things that leads to the fall of empires is, a, is division that occurs on many different levels. And one of them is through immigration. So at these early stages, they're not only um, united kind of in the, the, the goal, the vision, the mission, but even racially in their religion. There's, there's not a, a place in the early empire for pluralism. 
um, to really exist, you know, this kind of principled pluralism. So instead, this is men being men. The women are having children, uh, raising the children, but the children, early age, young young boys are, are brought into uh, adulthood, early age. You think about in our, our history of, of America, we have, you think of the Revolutionary War, young men as the age of 12 are captains of right, boats right. in the Navy. Yep. Captain, right? I mean, they, they are leading the charge. And, and so this is this age of conquest. It's, it's, it's a time of great expansion. And then what happens as this expansion occurs, as there's the, the going of where, you know, like we go west or we go wherever we're expanding the empire, something that begins to happen. And he calls this the age of commerce. It's where all the hard work and the fights and the battle begin to produce right, fruit. Yeah. This is what he says. He says, we've already considered the age of outburst or what I call the age of pioneers. When a little regarded people suddenly burst onto the world stage with a wild courage and energy. Then we saw that these new conquerors acquired the sophisticated weapons of the old empires and adopted their regular systems of military organization and training. A great period of military expansion ensued, which we call the Age of Conquest. The conquest result in the acquisition of vast territories under one government, thereby automatically giving rise to commercial prosperity. And we call this the Age of Commerce. What happens during this time, he divides this Age of Commerce in the two sections. There's the, the first half of it, which people maintain a lot of the characteristics of the people before them. He says the first half of the age of commerce appears to be peculiarly uh, splendid. The ancient virtues of courage, patriotism, and devotion to duty are still in evidence. The nation is proud, united, and full of self-confidence. Boys are still required, first of all, to be manly. Right. So there's your that's your yeah, answer yeah. to your question earlier, right? They're required to ride, to shoot straight, and to tell the truth. He says it's remarkable what emphasis is placed at this stage on the manly virtue of truthfulness. For lying is cowardice, the fear of facing up to the situation. He says the boy's uh, education is intentionally rough, frugal eating, hard living, breaking the ice to have a bath, and similar customs are aimed at producing a strong party and fearless breed of men. I'd imagine this is probably due to the fact that the same men that were the pioneers, the same men during that area, are still alive. They're, they're the, the fathers or the grandfathers, maybe, and they're still instilling this upon the young boys of that generation. That's why there's this still this emphasis in that early part of this stage. But then what begins to happen, uh, you know, like that those older generations die off, and they're still instilling that, but they're not necessarily instilling the purpose behind that into these men right mm -hmm. the men that they're instilling these principles in don't have the same circumstances to face off against right and so yeah they they recognize the importance of these virtues and things but when it comes time for them to raise the next generation they lack the kind of foundation for instilling that in the next generation and the next generation doesn't quite grasp it and it just becomes kind of spotty and at the same time that age of commerce becomes what he calls the age of affluence and he says this this wealth and we, we see this in scripture you know the love of money mm -hmm. and ease right uh he says the first direction in which wealth injures the nation is a moral one money replaces honor and adventure as the objective of the best young men Man, isn't that the truth wow Moreover, men do not normally seek to make money for their country or their community, but for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so gradually, he says, this age of influence silences the voice of duty, and therefore uh, your aim becomes money, it becomes ease, it becomes much easier then to, uh, you know, to, to become soft. You think of when Jesus talked about John the Baptist, and he said, did you guys come out to see a soft man you know, wearing, wearing soft yeah. clothes sitting in the palaces? Right. Right. It's, it's, uh, it is something about wealth and that, that love of that, if we're not careful, makes you soft. Right. They were surrounded in that time by 
you know, all the different Herods and the, the different wealthy, you know, men that, yeah, completely got consumed by it. Now listen to this part. This is what's very interesting here. So as money and the love of money takes over and you have wealth, you instead of needing weapons and needing to fight, you can actually buy off your enemies, right? There, there seems to be, you can yeah. pay off this thing. So there's less honor in that, it, you right. know, from right. a human standpoint. Right. And so he says, to justify this departure from ancient d- tradition, the human mind easily devises its own justification. Military readiness or aggressiveness is denounced as primitive and immoral. Wow, Civilized sounds familiar, huh? Yeah. Civilized people are too proud to fight, he says. Um, and what ends up happening is the pioneer age, those who were in the pioneer age, who were the heroes of all the people before, now become the villains. Yep. Sounds all too familiar. And, and so this age of people become, uh, they have this attitude of moral superiority to everything that came before them. And that leads to the last stage, which he calls the age of intellect. And whereas in the early ages, it's physical fighting and it's not as if it's unintelligent and if these people are just um, right right idiots that's what that's what the age of intellect is going to say about these people right it's it's the emphasis on intellect yeah so because you have all the time everything turns into debates <clears throat> and he says it's it's like debate non-stop without actually accomplishing anything it's the age of facebook <laughs> Basically, yeah, the age yeah. of Facebook, the age of Fox News. He talks about, uh, you know, this is before Fox News time when he writes this. It's the, it, before 24 hours of news cycle. But it's this age of where you're constantly talking. The Romans were would meet in, in Athens and, and they would just debate endlessly. Right. We even see that in scripture, right? You see mm-hmm. that Paul talks about that. At the same time, because people are growing soft, they need hard men and workers to do the hard things. So they start bringing in foreigners, uh, immigration heavily in all of these empires. Uh, because they have the money and the wealth, people want to come there. And at first, people are willing to blend in and um, join in. It's kind of a melting pot. But, but it, something starts to happen through the, all that debate and argument, there's division. Instead of a common interest, there's everybody fighting for their own interests. I mean, this a lot of this sounds, you know, this sounds very... Recent? Or, yeah, <laughs> recent, uh, familiar to us. Yeah. Right? And then, and then as part of this, as we're wrapping up his story, he says, frivolity then becomes very important, right? Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Uh, he says the heroes of declining nations are always the same, the athlete, the singer, or the actor. Wow, man. <laughs> wow. Um, and, and in fact, uh, interestingly enough, in uh, Baghdad, uh, in an ancient um, empire, they, would, they were complaining, the historians were complaining about pop singers that were <laughs> this was the, the 10th century in the second half of the wow. 10th century they were complaining That's that um, that they were bringing obscene sexual language into the music and so they tried to ban it but the influence kept coming back and and they were complaining about them playing this thing like a guitar <laughs> oh wow That's it's just it's that's I mean not that we should be surprised that history repeats itself but it's just insane when you look back and see how it really does repeat itself over and over. And then the last step here then, as he says, an increase in the influence of women in public life has often been associated with national decline. Uh, he says the Romans complained uh, that although the Rome ruled the world, women, women ruled Rome. Uh, the Arabs complained Uh, as their empire was falling apart of women entering all the professions of men 
and leaving behind the home. He said, many women practice law while others obtain posts as university professors. They became judges and they take over the nation as the men become soft. And what happens is government and public order collapses and foreign invaders overrun the empire. And the result then is that women are made unsafe. They're not even able to be unescorted in the streets because of what the feminist movements throughout history have done. Wow. <laughs> I keep saying wow, but it's just, it's nuts. It's its crazy to see how it the same thing happens over and over and, and the things that you know, we're seeing today, whether on social media or the news or, or just the, the freak outs from the feminist movement and what they want to do is the same thing that literally destroyed empire after empire after empire. Mm -hmm. and, and so what actually happens then as the empires fall apart, another empire takes its place, starting with those pioneers with men being men. And so what we kind of see then is there's this inevitability of men leading that's instilled in the rise and fall of empires really is installed in uh, the created order and we can fight against it we can let wealth and prosperity move us from it and we can we can even um, belittle it and call it evil ignorant a uh, time of age has passed but it's always inevitable I feel like I feel like there's there's a particular name for that. I just can't quite can't quite put my finger on it. It there might be a podcast with it in the name. <laughs> maybe. Maybe it's maybe it's patriarchy. Could it be? And that yeah, maybe. Bingo. So that's kind of why we are, in a sense, we're doing this podcast then, is we recognize where we're at. You know, we're not at the age of pioneers. We're, we're not at the age of conquest or even the age of con uh, of commerce. We've moved into that closer to that last stage in our, our time. And we, we feel, I think, uh, Tony, you would, you would agree with me. We feel the effects of all these things, even in ourselves, that we're, we're not the men that even we should be. Mm -hmm. Right. What we want to do then is to encourage and strengthen uh, men in this endeavor to be men and through that uh, grow ourselves as well. Exactly. That's that's exactly the reason we started this. And I, I hope that the people listening uh, appreciate this. And I hope that as you're listening to this, as we keep making episodes, that this helps you and that you can share this with other men. Because, like Joseph just said, we recognize we're, we're not even the men that we're supposed to be. We're, we're still trying to improve that. We're still trying to do better and correct where we're in the error and wrong and listen to other men that are older and wiser than us uh, to try to rectify the situation. Because I don't think we even have to make the case that our culture, our nation, is literally falling apart around us. Um, it's, it's headed in a completely opposite direction from what scripture tells us. And I think this book, uh, again, uh, it's called The Fate of Empires. You can find it for free, uh, anybody listening, you can find it for free actually out of the internet in PDF format. Um, and you can read it yourself, I encourage you to do that. Um, if we make a post of this on social media too, I'll try and include this uh, down in the link. So we're gonna take a break, but when we come back, we're going to talk with Michael Foster of It's Good to Be a Man about what the state of masculinity looks like right now, what's being done about it, and how we can encourage other men to lead and to lead well. But first, a word from an unlikely sponsor. Hi guys, this is Leonard from The Matriarchy. I just wanted to let you all know about our upcoming men's breakfast. And by breakfast, I don't mean steak and eggs or any pig bacon. <coughs> Ick. I mean egg white only omelets, freshly squeezed no pulp orange juice, and tofu bacon. Yum. We'll be discussing how to resolve conflict with your wife by not arguing. At all. And essentially just letting her run you over with her baby blue minivan. 
We find that the best way to have a happy marriage is to just not fight at all and be a doormat. You'll thank us later. Don't forget to sign up online at the First Church of Jesus Loves You So Much's website and pin us on Pinterest too, because every pin counts, friends. Toodaloo. Welcome back. With us today, we have Michael Foster from It's Good to Be a Man. He is the Associate Pastor at Trinity Presbyterian Church, graduate of Clear Note Pastor College in Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. He has served as a youth pastor, an assistant pastor, and a church planner, and he lives outside Greenville, South Carolina with his wife, Emily, and six children. Michael, welcome to the Patriarchy. Glad to be on here with you guys. Glad to have you. I think maybe I misunderstood what this show is about. You said this is about building up men. I, I thought this was about oppressing women. <laughs> <laughs> well. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people, uh, they actually already have said that, and they haven't even listened to an episode. <laughs> well, I'll do what I can, okay? Now, the, the reason we, we have you on here is that you've got a project called It's Good to Be a Man. And so could you just start us off and tell us how you became a man? Uh, well, I mean, it goes back to uh, oh, nine months before March 8th, 1980. Uh, there's a glimmer in my dad's eye, and here I am. So, right. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, uh, tell us about the project. Uh, what is the project, and uh, how'd you get started with it? Uh, sure. I, I had an idea. I've had an idea for a podcast like this for a long time. And I was looking for something to recommend to a friend. And when I searched all the different podcast directories, uh, there wasn't anything out there that was very good. Um, I mean, the best thing out there really is Art of Manliness. And uh, as helpful as that show is, it's not rooted in scripture. The host himself is uh, a Mormon. And uh, so I enjoyed that show. I listened to it uh, from time to time, but there wasn't anything that was biblically rich at all. So I'd been thinking about getting something like this up and rolling for a couple of years. And uh, then I started to notice some trends that seemed different from what I grew up with. Namely, I just saw lots of guys and girls in their 20s and 30s not getting married for some reason. These weren't people that had the gift of celibacy at all. Uh, they were single, but they didn't want to be single. And I started to see that uh, a lot of the advice and counsel I was giving folks that were in that sort of demographic wasn't very helpful. So I started studying the, uh, the topic anew, looking at it from that perspective. How do we help people uh, that, that want to be married, get married? What's going on? Why is, why is uh, marriage rates dropping? And that had me delay the project by a couple of years. Mm. And I realized there were some major gaps in my practical understanding of sexuality everything i had been taught was kind of typical complementarianism which ha focuses on intersexual dynamics as it relates to a, a already existing marriage or primarily on whether or not women can work outside the home or what sort of authority they can have in the church those are the three sort of areas uh, a lot of those books and articles kind of focus on but there's you know how do you get married how do you find a woman in in a in a post-internet world uh, things have really changed so as i started to study that i i had kind of some shifts in the way i looked at things and my friend non tenet who lives over in new zealand uh, we we have a lot of shared interests in biblical theology we like to argue about Genesis chapter 6 from time to time. But um, I found out that he was reading and thinking about a lot of the same things that I was thinking about. And I was like, look, we should we should do this project together. You know, two are better than one. Uh, he's a little different than me. And I'm he's a Reformed Baptist. I'm a confessional Presbyterian. We have slightly different perspectives and different gifts. So we started working on this project together. And the goal of it is really simple. Uh, we want to create a positive and practical doctrine of manhood. That's what we're after. We want to help um, 
men know how to be uh, manly, how to be good fathers, husbands, and uh, good patriarchs in this society uh, on whole. So that's that's the heart of the project right now. It's a website. It's goodtobeaman.com. It's a podcast. We're on our uh, 10th episode already, and we're trying to create things that actually are rooted in solid biblical theology, but also are very practical and help guys to take some steps um, at being uh, manly. Being manly is godly. God made men Mm -hmm. to be manly. Yeah. So that's the project in a nutshell. All right. Yeah, that's there's a lot of overlap with what we're seeking to do here. And we're excited what what you have done and you've been an influence on on me as well. Uh, Tell our listeners, what are some of the things you've got coming out? What are some of the things you've got planned uh, to come out? Well, uh, actually, tomorrow night we're recording a two-part podcast on how the curse has effect, affected sexuality. So what we're doing through our podcast is slowly working through sort of the the meta narrative of Scripture, mm-hmm. <laughs> as obnoxious as yeah. that word is, but from from Genesis all the way to Revelation and teasing out the the major themes and how they relate to human sexuality. So. We've already recorded one on the creation mandate. And then in between these sort of heavily theological episodes, we're trying to load up on more practical application and things like that. So we would love to produce a book because we think there's something that needs to exist that doesn't exist yet. Like Alistair Roberts just has a book that's came out. I haven't read it yet. But he's been really solid. I think when it comes to biblical theology, that book's going to be fantastic. Uh, But there's nothing that is both biblical and practical. So as we create this content for the podcast, for articles, we're hoping that can also serve as a framework for a book that we can get finished at some point. But along the way, we're creating PDFs that we can share with men that they can use to uh, get things moving in their own households. Good. So I've followed your page on Facebook for a while now and greatly appreciate it. Uh, I've noticed occasionally there's some negative comments, but it seems to be pretty positive. Uh, Can you give us some idea of the feedback you're getting? Sure. Uh, The attention that we're getting has been incredible. Uh, It's taken off. Even though the page and the, my, my Twitter uh, is really, um, is, is quite small. It's, it's amazing the people that are reaching out. Uh, some big name pastors, a lot of non-Christians. I got invited on a Kenneth podcast the other day. I was like, oh, you, wow. know, <laughs> you know I'm a Jew married to a non-Jew, right? <laughs> They're like, that's all right. We still like you. I was like, man, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> I'm for building bridges, but well, yeah. we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, but um, but so what I started doing as my Twitter took off because I've never been been one for Twitter. Uh, but as it, I started saying to anyone that followed me, I was a male follower, like, hey, uh, uh, I've got a block of time if you want to talk. So I started talking to these guys because I wanted to understand what they were dealing with, uh, what what are the the struggles that they're facing. <laughs> And it led to some pretty amazing conversations. I've got to see uh, us help people's marriage, uh, help help guys uh, figure out how to navigate this difficult relational marketplace and all that. So a lot of those men are like writing us and telling us how we've changed their life. And it's humbling. It's kind of crazy. Honestly, it, it is it actually isn't how awesome we are. It's how bad we are right now as a society. Amen. That'd be my main takeaway. My main takeaway is that uh, we we need we need better fathers. We need better pastors, and men are desperate, desperate for practical, encouraging words. So, call them to repentance. Tell them to get away from pornography and all that stuff. But you you can't just tell people no. You can't just tell people flee. You've got to give them God's yes. And you also have to give uh, them what to pursue and, they, and, and tell them you can do it. God made you to be a man, to be a patriarch. This is your design. You're supposed to do this, right? Yes. You can do this. This is what God made you to be, right? So let's get to it. And so it's been really encouraging. Of course, we've got some people that say we're trying to oppress women. Uh, you're always going to have those folks out there. And uh, I, I, I love trolls. I grew up 
I grew up watching in Living Color and listening to Two Live Crew and rap. When, when I was a kid, it was all about your mama jokes, right? Your yeah, mama's so yeah. fat that her blood type's ragu. Right? <laughs> uh, your, your mama's so hairy that Bigfoot takes pictures of her, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, all those sorts of things. These are old school. So I, I respect a good insult. I respect some trolling. And these women will always tell us how we're fragile men, and how we drive a pickup truck. I don't have a pickup truck. I'd like one. I drive a mega van full of a bunch of kids. Yep. Um, but that stuff doesn't bother me. That that just means when we're getting shot at both by anti-feminists and feminists, I think we're staying in between the ditches. And that's what we're trying to do. We're, we, there is such thing as misogyny, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But there's also such thing as misandry, and we don't want to be in either one of those dishes. God designed male and female, and both are good when lived according to his design. That's right. Um, you, you mentioned a couple uh, pastors had reached out to you. Are you at liberty to say any of the ones that have, or if there's any collaboration with any of them? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I just, I, here's what I will say. I, I've been blown away by the diversity of the men that have reached out to me. Some of them are guys that I would say are guilty of promoting servant leadership, guilty of promoting this reduced sexuality. Well, you know, pause for just a second. What do you mean sure. by uh, the, for our listeners, yeah. I know what you mean, but yeah. what do you mean by servant leadership there? Sure, uh, servant leadership is all about service, not about leadership. And so the, uh, pr the problem is that a lot of times when we talk about biblical manhood and womanhood, the only thing the evangelical church wants to talk about is servant leadership. And that's the idea that the, the man is a servant to his wife and his child. Well, the truth is the man is a servant to God mm -hmm. and he provides his God given service uh, to those in his household. And that service mainly takes the form of leadership, not saying, honey, what do you want out of life? Son, what do you want out of life, right? We don't exist here to make our wife's dreams come true. We don't exist to make our kids' dreams. We, we exist to fulfill God's commands, right? And so there is a service we give to those in, in our home, but it's not about being a pack mule. It's not about being someone that is a um, supplier of goods and services according to the market-based needs of our wife or children. That's not what we do. We're fathers, we lead. And so um, so that's the most common type of spiel you hear on sexuality nowadays. And that's what complementarianism has been reduced to, to servant leadership. The man has the tie-breaking vote in the home. Uh, a woman can do anything an unordained man can do. I mean, that's, that's Tim and Kathy Keller pushing stuff like that. So some of the people that have reached out to me, not Tim Keller, <laughs> to be clear, <laughs> but, but some of the people that have reached out to me are pretty infamous for talking about servant leadership and complementarianism in a way that I've been very critical of. And, uh, and I don't really feel like dropping names yet, but the fact that they're listening is blowing my mind. And again, I think what, it, what it's revealing is that we are in some dark times, and if you care about men, your eyes are starting to open up and say, wait a second, something, something's going on. Uh, there's a sickness, and we, we are not dealing with it right. So I think that's why some of these guys are actually listening that you would never thought in a million years. It's been very humbling to me. It's taught me like, look, uh, let's see what the Holy Spirit will do through our words. Before we decide how people are gonna react to our rebuke and correction, Right. Let's actually try it. And maybe God will change them hearts. Maybe maybe we'll see revival in the church and sexuality. I know we will eventually, but maybe we'll see it sooner. We'll, we'll find out. All right, Michael. Well, thank you for uh, sharing with us about your project. Um, how can people find you and support your work? Sure. Uh, go to it's good to be a man dot com. Read our articles and apply it in your life. That's the main way you can support our work. Our work is trying to help men be more godly and more manly. So if you want to encourage us, just read it and do it. If you actually want to follow what we have to say, you can find me on Twitter at This Is Foster. You can follow my co producer, Non Tenet, at B N O N N, the B is silent, non. You can also, we have a Facebook group that's just facebook.com forward slash It's Good to Be a Man. And uh, the best way to support us is to repent and believe the gospel, be godly, you know, get married, have lots of babies. Let's take over. Amen. Amen to that. Hey, thanks for joining us, Michael. My pleasure. 
That was Michael Foster from It's Good to Be a Man. Go check him out. We're going to take a quick break. Summer is a time to relax for some, but also the busiest time of year for others. No matter which you are, any time is when you can start to slip from being in the Word of God. We at the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network want to challenge you to read through the New Testament this summer. Like all good men, we have a plan to do that. Head over to ChristKirk.com, that's ChristKirk, K-I-R-K, dot com, forward slash Bible challenge, and download the reading checklist. You can also sign up for the email list, join the Facebook group too. Don't let the summer slump or the summer busyness pull you out of the Word of God. Manliness starts in the Word. Head over to ChristKirk.com, that's ChristKirk, K-I-R-K, dot com, forward slash Bible challenge, and get your head in the game. Welcome back. That was a great interview with Michael Foster. Uh, before I end our episode out for uh, today, Spurgeon, you uh, you got any final thoughts? Yeah, it was good to have Michael Foster on here, and I hope our, our listeners have uh, seen the foundations of, of fatherhood, of men being men, women being women. You know, uh, a good reminder again is that both men and women are created in the image of God. They're co-heirs in Christ, and yet they, God made us with different functions, different roles. There's actually hierarchy in the created order. Can you say that word? Hierarchy? People hate it, <laughs> but that's what's there. And yet it doesn't mean inequality. Right. Uh, uh, for example, a man who does not see his children and his wife as equal in the image of God, he's become a Pharisee. He's, he's made himself out to be the father above, to be creator. And he's forgotten that his fatherhood comes from the father and he's usurped the throne. But likewise, a man who does not see his duty to lead his home in righteousness, to command his household after him to follow God, he is also a man who has usurped the throne of God because he's denied that God has ordained authority. So what we want to do again is to encourage the men out there that patriarchy is inevitable because it's part of God's created order. Therefore, seek to live as the man God has made you to be. Be a man who leads his home. Be men who lead in the church and lead in society. Uh, Be a pioneer. And that is our episode for today. If you have not yet become a Fight, Laugh, Feast Club member, Go to FightLaughFeast.com, click Join the Club, and use the code PATRIARCHY when you sign up to get yourself access to some behind-the-scene content, support us, and support the network in the process. Until next time, if you have not yet bowed your knee to Christ, repent and believe. For those of you that have, this is our call to you. Build, fight, protect, lead. This is The Patriarchy. (laughs) 